of Garrett's Meditations. I've been doing that to my friends in the Bay Area, so we might get some from there now. <laughs> they I, I told him early on he needs to collect these and write a book. Well, somebody up there said um, that he reminded them of Anne Lamott. So I wanted to know, Garrett, do you know Anne Lamott? Uh, being told that I remind anyone of Anne Lamont is one of the nicest things I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> what the what? <laughs> you were in Marin City often enough, I think. Yeah, I, you know what? And I never met her. My, really? My mentor was the uh, the pastor at St. Andrew before I got to seminary. But she started attending St. Andrew Marin City um, while he was pastor. Yes. Um, and so uh, I, she was at his funeral and that was the only time I saw her in person. So she has heard me speak in person, but I, I've never heard her speak in person. So. <laughs> okay, Tony, we have to get him involved in her speaking, huh? <laughs> Tony, mm -hmm. we have to get Garrett involved in the next time Anne next, Lamott speaks. Next time she's here, we'll include him, yeah. Yeah. Well, you should, uh, have we brought her as a church? For the view. Mm no, she yeah, was really. part of the UCSB Arts and Lectures, and she spoke in Santa Barbara a couple of years ago, and then she did a virtual one just a few months ago. Well, amen. I, uh, I saw her uh, in late January. I, I attended a, uh, a conference for a week online, and she was their first speaker. I love her. I really do. Oh, I, I do, too. But hearing all of that makes me happy because I have not written this week. And, uh, and so <laughs> now I will. So uh, thank you and uh, let's pray. Good and gracious God, grateful for smiling faces, for some laughter, for excitement about you and excitement about your word. Illuminate it for us so that in these ancient, crazy, absurd, mildly, incomprehensible words we might in the midst of it discover your loving heart and know that there is grace hope joy compassion and goodness in everything that we read by your grace may it be so we pray this in the strong name of jesus amen amen we move that direction all right, Leviticus. Uh, last week we were doing chapter five and we went into chapter six a little bit. And uh, Claudia's left already. So, uh, it's, uh, no, we're oh, back. The sun is coming directly at us and we can't decide. We haven't had this problem until daylight savings time. So, we don't know what to do about it exactly. Uh, I don't, I, I, I can't help you. Uh, <laughs> it'll, it'll soon go away. It's setting. There, there is something special about bathing in sunlight. So, uh, yes. amen. <laughs> uh, you two are going to be able to tell me what's going on. Um, by ending in Leviticus chapter six, the way we did, we went through all of the different offerings that are in Leviticus one through five. And it goes into chapter six in most of our Bibles. And there are other versions of Leviticus where the part that we went into in chapter six continue, uh, ends in chapter five. Um, so like that first seven verses of chapter six are actually in chapter five in a different version. And that makes sense because today we're going to do six and seven, um, but we're going to start on six, eight, because that's where we ended off. And um, so Real quick, I want on you also to know I had my first shot of vaccine this morning. So, amen to that. But I, I'm experiencing some weird flush. Uh, I'm not. Uh, who knows what's going to happen in three weeks when I have the other one? But I'll, I'm planning on being here in three weeks. So, if I look a wreck, I apologize in advance. <laughs> We've all been there. Thanks for the chuckle, Gary. Um, it's. Uh, <laughs> So we've gone through five major kinds of offerings or sacrifices so far. And the first one we did in chapter one was the burnt offering, which is uh, the full animal consumed. 
The, the second one is the cereal offering and the cereal offering is a uh, you know, cereal, uh, some kind of grain, part of it's consumed, part of it's saved for the priest. Uh, and then we went into the peace or fellowship offering and the peace or fellowship offering is the one that's generally for celebration um, or vows or something. It's, it's some kind of moment in time when you're experiencing something. One of the ones that is either, depending on whom, to whom you read, either the most common or the least common. And then we went through uh, the, uh, the, the, the purification offering. Uh, no, I'm sorry. Before the purification off. Wait, no, it is purification offering. I'm struggling on my own thing. No, sin offering and then purification offering. And the, and the sin offering, which can also be called the purification offering or the guilt offering, which is the rep reparation offering. Oh, sweet Lord. There's so many things. So let's try again. Burnt offering, cereal offering. The peace offering, which is also called the fellowship offering because people had fellowship together eating a meal from the offering. And then we have the, uh, the sin offering or the purification offering, which is to when one's committed a sin, it purifies them from their sin that has made them unclean. And, and then finally, the guilt offering or the reparation offering or compensation offering, which is when you pay back to God a portion of what your sin has caused, which is separation from God. And so now you're paying back to God a portion of things in an effort to uh, be one with God again. And these ancient offerings that all Christians will say are no longer things with which we need to worry about because uh, Jesus and um, if I'm going to say because Jesus, we, uh, we can also uh, think of uh, with the whole because Jesus. Uh, how many of you are just super familiar and in love with the book of Hebrews in the New, Bi uh, New Bible, New Testament? Claudia, you raise your hand. Bruce, you're like, I have to as well. <laughs> <laughs> Hebrews is where we get a lot of these things, which is always talking about how all of these offerings we no longer need to participate in because Jesus took care of them all. Um, and since we're a week away from Holy Week, uh, and that's next week, oh, wow. I have a lot of work <laughs> to do next week. Um, I love Holy Week, love it. Uh, so Palm Sunday coming up with uh, all of that and, and Jesus uh, basically signing his own death warrant by marching into Jerusalem as some kind of conquering hero. So Rome wanted to end them on Monday. Thereafter, he cleansed the temple. So the religious people wanted to end him. And we're already talking about that. On Tuesday, he sat in the temple and taught uh, on Wednesday, uh, a little bit less of work, but he was in Bethany going through the things. And that's when the woman washed his uh, hair or feet, depending on the things with the costly nard. Thursday was the last supper. Friday was death. Um, and then Easter Sunday. Uh, so that's all coming up. But we say uh, as Christians that in this next week, this Holy Week, Jesus did work that keeps us from having to worry about these. But this does not mean that as we go through these Levitical offerings that we cannot learn a lot about God. And so again, the burnt offering was always for atonement. Now we're so often used to hearing atonement with regards to our sin because we've sinned, we need atonement. Uh, but they have a purification offering and a guilt offering. Like their offerings, aren't uh, uh, have things for that atonement that has to come from from sin so atonement just isn't from sin but this complete notion that is a part of leviticus whereby the divine presence is in the tabernacle and we're about to read a little bit about how the priest have to keep the fire going on the altar 24 7 and uh and, and and you will read not today but later that when all of this was done and said to Moses that a fire came from heaven and lit the altar. And so the idea of containing, keeping the fire going is the continuation that comes from God. Um, and so this idea of divine presence and what one has to do to ensure the divine presence is, is kept. And this goal of God's uh, desire for creation of having people who are participating in the divine endeavor for the divine intention. Part of that necessitates, again, in the midst of everything that we've done, the center of the nation is the tabernacle. All tribes 
camp around it with the with the elders being closest to the tabernacle and everything happens in there and if there is this eternal fire that's going up there's always a pillar of smoke which again if you remember from Exodus, there was a pillar of smoke that guided the people by day and a pillar of fire that guided people by night. So you'll see smoke by day and you can see the fire going all night long. So it's keeping that presence of God that was a part of the Exodus with these endless amounts of offerings. Uh, the burnt offering, uh, which is the first one that's mentioned in chapter one and is going to be again in chapter six and seven mentioned. Um, is something that had to be done every morning and every evening. So there's constant burnt offerings being done. And, and then if people are having anything else they're doing, so there's just constant offerings. Now, when we first started reading Leviticus, everything that we were reading was Moses being told by God, tell the people, tell the Israelites, tell the whole congregation. And so when we read these things, we see some stuff that seems to just be information for the congregation as a whole. There is some elements of the things that we read in the first five chapters that have stuff that's also included uh, for the priest to perform their priestly function. But now when we get into six and seven, we're going to go through those same five offerings again, uh, except now it's more from the perspective of the priest. We have no idea why we're having to uh, look at these five again, uh, why it wasn't a part of the first five chapters. And so before we get into the meat of it, a couple of hypotheses as to why we're looking at it again. One, all of the Bible comes from a bunch of sources that people put together. Does that make sense? Yes. Yes. So the Bible is from all sorts of places. And how many of you were taught when you were growing up that the first five books of the Bible, the Torah, was written by Moses? Yeah, I don't A couple. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I don't know if I was taught that, but I heard it along the way. If you think that Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible, let me tell you, not many people who are scholars agree with you. How do I know that? Because again, the language changes up in different places. And the easiest way to explain that is just with the story of the flood. And again, in the flood, there's two versions that are mixed together. And one says you have to take one pair of all animals. And another says you have to take seven pairs of clean animals and one pair of unclean animals. Now, why would there be a difference? Because if the priest is writing the story of Noah, what has not happened by the time of Noah that would happen later that would allow Noah to know the difference between clean and unclean animals? This stuff. Maybe Leviticus. <laughs> Maybe Leviticus. Thank you. <laughs> like Leviticus is the part that begins talking about that which is clean and unclean. And there's no way the priests thought that Noah could know that before God told Moses about that. So the priestly strand of Noah is intentionally telling us that there's only one pair of every animals because there was no differentiation between clean and unclean at that time because <laughs> God had not given that to Noah. Now, there's another strand of that same story that talks about the seven pairs of clean animals and the one pair of unclean animals. And that is one of those things that we can begin to see how there's as many different voices that bring together the scripture as we know it. So there are those who say that this part of Leviticus, Leviticus 6 and 7, is something that belongs at the end of like Exodus 28 or Exodus 29 or something. And, and it was like, it was initially there. And then when they combined it all, it ended up there. Now, who cares? Because we don't know. It's interesting uh, scholarly endeavor. And if you're anyone like me who likes to read about such things and hypothesize about such things, that's lovely. And I remember when I said it in a sermon one time and I had three different people come up to me and say, I have never learned that before. How come I've never learned that before? 
And I'm like, well, what else did you get out of the sermon? And they're like, oh, I didn't actually, nothing. Like, I just never knew that before. <laughs> and I was like, that's why. Like, it makes for a, a garbage sermon if I'm just trying to teach these intricate little details that don't matter. And they don't really matter because in the end, what we have is what we have. It's good to know that it came from pieces because it keeps us from getting too much hubris about our understanding of it. We get to exist in the mystery of Leviticus. And now, if one through five is geared toward the whole congregation, as God continually tells Moses, tell the people of Israel, then six and seven are geared particularly to the priest. Now, that doesn't mean that there is elements of, of informing the whole congregation. So it might be that in the final form, whoever decided to create the final form, they knew that if you had these first five chapters that were the people's thing, okay, this is how you find the animal that you need. This is what you do. The priest is going to do this. This is what your part is. You stay away from the priestly part. Now, here's the priestly function. And we're going to read a little bit of that. Now, uh, that means we are in Leviticus 6, 8, and it took me 15 minutes to talk about things before, and I have every intention of finishing uh, three pages of scripture. Let's see if that happens. Does anyone want to read Leviticus 6, 8 through 6, 13? I can. Oh, thank you, Claudia. The Lord said to Moses, give Aaron and his sons this command. Real These... quick, I'm going to interrupt you whenever I want. I apologize. <laughs> um, but it, it just, it just to kind of think. So now if you can see, uh, maybe, you, if you, maybe you're not remembering anything. But this is the first time that God tells Moses, give Aaron and his sons this command. So we can see the change a little bit. This is definitely geared not for the whole of the people, but for, uh, for the priests. These are the regulations for the burnt offering. The burnt oh, offering. I'm going to interrupt you again. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is the problem uh, with, with these things. And, and, uh, and how I, I uh, thank you. Um, now, you read regulation. What, what uh, version are you in? <laughs> NIV. NIV. Okay, good. NIV, and I have the NRSV. And the NIV and the NRSV are uh, the most no. mainline Protestant uh, translations of the Bible that exist. Yeah. So these are two very good translations. And one, one says uh, regulation and one says ritual. The, the word in, uh, in, in Hebrew, we're not quite sure what it means but it, it has a sense of ritual or a sense of regulation. And so what is the difference between a regulation and a ritual? And why might we want to consider that? Well, a regulation is kind of like a law and something that's enforced or whereas a ritual is sort of something you do out of tradition, tradition and reverence. So let's take both of those, Bruce, because I think you answered that brilliantly um, and combine them. This is a law. God is telling you what to do. And this is about reverence and tradition and things will go on for eternity, eternity. And, uh, and so it keeps on going. And, and much like we're not quite sure why all of these things are, maybe you just kind of reach a place in time where you don't know why you're doing things anymore. Uh, but you keep doing them because one, God said so, and two, because you've experienced God in them. So whether it's regulation or ritual, uh, I, I just pointing out that word in that house. And I promise you, uh, I'll let you speak maybe a little while longer. In a revised standard version, it actually just says law. Does it really? Yeah. The Lord said to Moses, saying, this is the law of the burnt offering. And he uses the law word? again. This is the law of the cereal offering. And this is the, uh, goes on. Law. Well, well, the word is Torah. Um, yeah. So there you go. <laughs> Any, anyhow. Okay. Um, 
Sorry, I just thought. Thank, no, Gary, thank you for that. I, I, I like that. Uh, so uh, there we go. When I was growing up in the church, the Revised Standard Version was the ultimate Bible, I guess. I don't know. Uh, and it was. And then they made the new Revised Standard Version, which became uh, the ultimate for most mainline Protestants. But the NIV has always been there as well. I don't mainline. Never mind. <laughs> I, don't, I don't mainline. I sideline. Could I I'll go let on? you keep talking. Yes, please. The burnt offering is to remain on the altar hearth throughout the night till morning, and the fire must be kept burning on the altar. The priest shall then put on his linen clothes with linen undergarments next to his body and shall remove the ashes of the burnt offering that the fire has consumed on the altar and place them beside the altar. Then he is to take off these clothes and put on others and carry the ashes outside to the outside the camp to a place that is ceremonially clean. The fire on the altar must be kept burning. It must not go out. Every morning, the priest is to add firewood and arrange the burnt offering on the fire and burn the fat of the fellowship offerings on it. The fire must be kept burning on the altar continuously. It must not go out. So every oh, day they have fellowship offerings? Uh, maybe. I mean, again, there are some people who say the fellowship offering is the least common. And I have read others who say the fellowship offering is the most common. Yeah. Okay. So I, uh, I love reading things that tell me different stuff. And they both come from authorities and, and books that people recommend because it just reminds me that, again, we have no idea. Um, but we do know that it was supposed to be a perpetual fire on this. Now, I've already mentioned that the fire begins on this in a couple of chapters when fire comes out of heaven and consumes the initial offering. And so after that fire comes out of heaven to consume the initial offering, the law requires, the ritual requires, the regulations require the priest to continually keep that fire going. Basically all night long when there's not things going on, but that burnt offering in the evening is still slowly being consumed. And then by the, the morning time before the burnt offering that begins the whole offering kind of thing of the morning is, 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 is given. Um, they have to remove all of the ash and there is things with regards to uh, how they have to change their clothes for that. And the first kind of clothes they have to wear is when they're actually cleaning up the ash. And then they have to change their clothes to go to the ceremonial clean place to discard the ash. Now, why on earth do you think that God would require any of that? Can't think. <laughs> Good. Purification. Oh. No, and you're right, Gary, and that is the exact right answer. It has everything to do with obscure purification ideas that we simply do not understand anymore, other than being able to say this. The rituals that took place at the altar were now in the court of the tabernacle. And then you could go into the first room where there was the incense altar. And the incense altar was a place where priests alone could go. No one of the congregation could go into where the incense altar is. And then there was the Holy of Holies. Yeah. And the only one who could go in there was the high priest. Yes. Yes. And so you had these different places where people can go. And everything where you went, again, there was ideas of holiness. And what does even the word holiness mean? I mean, we use the word enough, right? Well, I think of it as of God. Of God works or set apart. Yeah. Um, something not of uh, polluted by creation, of us. Um, and God being other. So this is the transcendent idea of God. And, uh, and so if you're going to be doing this kind of work, 
there was certain kind of clothes that stayed near the altar. Oh. You couldn't take those clothes away from the altar because if you took them away from the altar, you would make those clothes ceremonially unclean, even if you were going to dispose of the ashes in a ceremonially clean place. Because as soon as you leave the presence of God, whom are you around the presence of? Ungodly people. <clears throat> All sorts of potential sin. And so you had a change of clothes to after you cleansed the thing to or cleaned up the ash to go out to do that. Does that seem absurd to us? Quite possibly. And yet, nevertheless, they're recognizing the otherness of God. That the areas of God deserve the reverence. So again, Bruce, when you mentioned the reverence of ritual. This is the reverence of ritual. When you do these kinds of things. Now, 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 now think about it again for ourselves. Now, what if you were being served communion and instead of somebody saying the bread of life, the cup of salvation, or Christ's body broken for you, Christ's bread shed for you, or something like that, they're like, here's some bread, here's some juice. Yeah. Does that take away the reverence of the ritual that we're doing when we said, here's some bread, here's some juice. Well, it has no reverence. Exactly. Added, no reverence added to it. And, and it's taken away, it, it belittles the act. Years ago, um, I did a baptism where I did not put on my robe and my stole. I had a stole on, but I didn't put on the robe. And I saw pictures of it later. And I didn't like it. I was like, I look like I could be anybody else. They're like someone who just was like, let me throw on some. There's something about the vestments when I'm doing the sacraments that let me feel when I'm looking at it myself, when I'm not the participant, but when I'm looking at it, like there is a reverence that's going on with the sacraments that would otherwise not be going on. And, uh, and so ever since then, every time I do a baptism, I, you know, I, I robe up, um, even in churches where people are like, why are you wearing robe? And I'm like, because now we're dealing with, with this kind of thing, um, which doesn't mean I think people need to be dressed up to the hilt every time they go to church or anything like that. But therein lies still the piece of why we used to wear our Sunday best when we went to church anyway, was this notion of like, I'm encountering God. And strangely enough, if you go Go to churches where there are the most poor people in the South, you will find people who are widely better dressed than any of the more affluent churches in the South. Why? Because for them, that reverence still exists, that desire to, I, I get it. When I have had to dress up in a suit and tie, the last thing I want to do on a Sunday when I go to church, especially when I'm not preaching, is wear a suit and tie. But I'm a white collar person. Now, if you're a blue collar person, you're not getting anything more. Uh, suddenly on a Sunday morning, you're being told, we're going to church. We're going to this place. We're in this world that tells you you don't matter. The God of the universe is not only telling you that you matter, but that you are loved. What should you wear? And okay. people are like, I'm going to wear my Sunday best. And this is a little bit of that Sunday best. Now, again, I'm not trying to tell anybody what they need to do. I understand why we've evolved to some degree past that. But uh, nevertheless, the reason for that, again, is this very sense of not polluting God, of leaving things reverent. And, and again, with the perpetual fire. Why the perpetual fire? We don't know. There are those who say the perpetual fire is because initially it comes from God. And so that initial spark is from God. And so they keep that spark going. so it never goes out. So the fire is always from God. And thereby they know that the, the presence of God is always with them. And then there are those who say, well, you have to keep the fire going because it lets you know the amount of work that has to kind of go into the whole thing. And maybe it's both. Can you imagine being one of the priests who gets to be charged to be up all night long, keeping the fire going? And where do they get all this wood? Good question. <laughs> and 
<laughs> and how are they harvesting the wood? And how are they making sure by the time they're in Jerusalem that there's still wood left over after all these things? And what are, we don't know. But these plans had to be kind of in place of things too. The perpetual fire though, reminds me a little bit of when Paul wrote in First Thessalonians, pray without ceasing and in all things give praise to God. How many people pray without ceasing? Me. Just me? I'm kidding, by the way. No, there's plenty <laughs> of times when... Um, by that, though, Paul did not mean be endlessly on your knees praying. What he did mean was always have an attitude whereby the presence of God is acknowledged in your life. Yes. Now, I'm better at that than sometimes. When you see a fire going all the time, when it's always there, I read a story recently um, about a uh, Roman Catholic church. I think it was in uh, Italy during some plague. And, uh, and of course, because of it was during some plague, everything was shut down. And I was reading the story. I'm like, boy, this sounds familiar. And, uh, and in this particular town, the priest went every day to the church and did mass, even though no one was there. But there were diaries that were read later of people of how they would look through their windows and see the priest walking to the church every day. And they knew that the priest was in the church making prayers and petitions and doing the mass and thereby again, reenacting the sacrifice of Christ, thereby bestowing grace upon the people over and over again. Why do Catholics have so much mass? Because for them, it's sacrificial. And so they must do it continuously, daily, much like here. Just because we're Protestants and we protested everything that was wrong with the Catholics, sometimes we fail to recognize what was right with the Catholics. Yes. This is that same kind of thing, this endless continuation, this praying without ceasing, this knowing that God is in our midst. Because what happens when we forget that God is in our midst, especially in churches? I think we can all have our own horror stories of something. Yeah. Dissension. Dissension. We forget to love one another. We forget to love one another because we're endlessly trying to figure out how to do our own will instead of God's will. I'm guilty of all these things myself. I, I mean, please know that I... Uh, I know the old adage, if you ever point a finger at somebody else, three fingers are pointing back at you, which generally is why I point like this now. <laughs> then you have your whole elbow. <laughs> um, wow, that looked odd on screen. Um, the, uh, but the joy of all of this is that continual recognition that we need to remember that God is with us. Now, have I ever told anybody the story of why I always have a rosary with me? Told me. You told, okay. Well, I'll just, the rosary and why, why I bother with the rosary. Because I do realize that I'm a Protestant and, and I had a meeting uh, at St. Patrick's last night. We were all masked in places and, and uh, everyone who was not Catholic for the meeting was actually on Zoom. I didn't know I could be on Zoom. So I showed up in person <laughs> and, uh, and I'm wearing a rosary and I have a Buddhist mala on. I had another rosary in my hands and, and, and the priest was like, aren't you Presbyterian? I'm like, yeah, I'm, a, I'm a bad Presbyterian. He's like, it's a very beautiful rosary. I'm like, and it's blessed by the holiness of the Holy Father. And he was like, really? I'm like, yeah, yeah. And, uh, and, and, and so first time I, I saw a Presbyterian holy in a rosary, I was in seminary. And it was the chaplain of the seminary, a beautiful soul named Charles Marx, one of my favorite people ever. And he was also the, uh, the, the polity professor in the seminary. But uh, he always carried a rosary. I never asked him about it until I was a chaplain's assistant for one year. And the year I was a chaplain's assistant, I'm sitting down in his office one day going through the worship services that I'm working on for that week. 
And, uh, and I finally said, Charles, why do you have a rosary? We're Presbyterian. We don't pray the rosary or have rosaries. There's no prayer beads in our traditions. And he says, well, I don't much pray the rosary, but I've discovered that if I'm holding it, I have a much, much harder time not remembering God and not remembering to do the right thing. Because a symbol of God is always in my hands. And I was like, ooh, that's deep. I mean, I was 23 years old. I mean, it didn't take much for me to think it was deep. I'm like, that's deep. Uh, I think I need a rosary. And uh, Charles, with the rosary that I'd always seen him hold, just takes it and goes like that. And I hold out my hand. He drops it in my hand. I'm like, I, I can't take your rosary. He says, I have more at home, but if you think it's going to help you, and then he said, pray without ceasing, then take it. I held that rosary and I kept it for years until somebody once asked me, Garrett, you're a Presbyterian. Why do you have a rosary? And I told them that story. And that person said, I think I should get a rosary. And I went like this. And he's like, I can't take it. I'm like, yes, you can. I have more. Same way I got that one. And he's like, okay. And had he said a second time, I can't take it. My sentimentalism would have trumped everything. I'm like, yeah, give that back to me. Um, but it's, uh, we have these things and, and they help us to remember. So what helps you to remember? That's what this Leviticus piece is about, of the perpetual fire. You know, when we walk into church, we see it on the communion table every week, right there. What does it say on the communion table? In remembrance of me. In remembrance, In remembrance of me. Now, we're Presbyterians, and we're not very good with our sacraments. We're just not. It's why Presbyterians can think that you can do the communion four times a year and think you've done it. Whereas <laughs> Catholics do communion 365 days a year. 366 if it's a leap year <laughs> and that's just assuming they have one mass a day and i've never seen a catholic church that has one mass a day they have like a dozen like it's an endless celebration an endless remembering um the disciples of christ denomination which uh, was my undergrad and there were people as i went to seminary who were from that denomination who were trying to recruit me and I said, I can't be a disciple of Christ. And they were like, why not? And I'm like, because I, I believe in infant baptism and you all don't. But I really do like that they, uh, they, they have communion every week. And there is offshoot of Presbyterians from about 250 years ago. Um, they just got tired of not having communion every week. And, and the, the Presbytery of which they were a part said, nope, sorry, you don't need to do that every week. And they were like, we need to remember and then I have people who tell me something like, well, you know, if you do it too frequently, it doesn't feel special anymore. And every time I've ever heard anyone tell me, like, and I had to be like, what I mean, my, my first church, they did it four times a year. And immediately I was like, first Sunday of every month. And there was somebody who's like, it doesn't feel special anymore. And I was like, shut up. I mean, that's what my voice wanted to say. But I, luckily for the moment, I was able to keep myself. In if we need God to feel special. If God is something we can only experience at pieces of time, like we are a C and E Christian, and we need these huge moments or this kind of thing to make it feel special, we're not understanding what we're doing. When Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me over and over again, we need to remember what Jesus did what the broken body in the poured out blood mean. The death, the, the cross, the, the center symbol of our tradition, the, the thing that Muslims can't handle and say that, in fact, Jesus didn't die on the cross. He was absorbed to heaven because there was no way that God would make God's servant suffer. And we believe that not only would God make God's servant suffer, but God became a person to suffer God's self so that we know in our own suffering, we're never alone. So why do I do this over and over and over again? Because I need to remember, because I live in a world that forgets. I mean, like, what's it like that America is back to normal? We've had seven mass shootings in the last week. 
right back to normal, America. But we don't remember. We forget the very next day. We just kind of go on with things. We need to remember. And, and we need to remember God's presence. Now, I'm not saying I'm going to try to change the nation. But you all are in a church that for this moment in time, I am a part of. I don't know how long that's going to last. God hasn't told me. But for the time being, I do need to tell you this. Never forget. Because we go through our days and we forget endlessly. And there's a perpetual fire that was on this altar to remind the people forever that God was near, that God is holy, that God is just, and that you best remember what God wants. Because if you don't, well, then God goes away. And there's many churches I've walked into where it feels as though God has gone away. Twenty minutes, huh? I'm not finishing this. <laughs> <sighs> I'm just going to read so I can interrupt myself. Um, I'm on <laughs> verse fourteen. So so far we've managed through six verses, and I wanted to do two chapters. This is great. This is the ritual of the grain offering. So okay, now we've talked about the burnt offering and that kind of ritual, but now it's talking about the grain offering. Remember, the grain offering is the second offering that's mentioned in Leviticus 12. Now, there is going to be a switch up after the grain offering. The peace offering, the fellowship offering is not mentioned to the end here, but the other two come in the same order. And the reason they might be mentioned separately in 6 and 7 is, is because of the importance of the offerings. There's a sense that the fellowship offering actually meant the least um or it was just the the maybe it, it there was those who say that or there's others who say it just talks about what the priest can eat and and how the burnt offering the no one eats anything of the burnt offering right the burnt offering is burned but the grain offering the purification offering and the sin o- or in the in a guilt offering and i'm changing the names of all these things the 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 <laughs> The, the grain offering is the same, but the, uh, the, the, the purification offering might be called the sin offering, and the guilt offering might be called the reparation offering. Um, these all include things that the priests eat. And the fellowship offering or the peace offering includes things that both people can eat. So my guess isn't that it's going in order of importance, but in order of who gets to eat what. The burnt offering, no one gets to eat anything, it's burnt. The grain offering, the priests get to eat something, and we're about to read about that. And we're about to read that when a priest is the one giving the offering, the priest does not get to eat the offering of the grain offering. All of that gets to be consumed. And then by the time you get to the fellowship offering, it talks about how the priest gets a portion and how the other portion goes to the rest of the people who are there. And... uh, So let's just kind of see this a little bit. So 14, this is the ritual of the grain offering. The sons of Aaron shall offer it before the Lord in front of the altar. So again, we already know how some of it was split up, but now this is coming to the priest. This is the priest's perspective. They shall take from it a handful of the choice flour and oil of the grain offering with all the frankincense that is on the offering. So remember, the frankincense was a part of the grain offering. Now, no one eats frankincense, hopefully. If you ever tried to eat frankincense, the indigestion is incredible. <laughs> I literally have no idea about that. So please don't repeat that and be like, the pastor said that and he must have tried it. I have no idea. I'm making things up because um, I'm crazy. <laughs> but the, uh, So uh, you bring the frankincense, but the full of the frankincense is placed on the part that's going to be burned. And it's telling the people that again. Um, with all the frankincense that is on the offering, and they shall turn its memorial portion into smoke on the altar as a pleasing odor to the Lord. Aaron and his son shall eat what is left of it. It shall be eaten as unleavened cakes in a holy place. So again, a holy place. What does that mean? It would be part of the temple that nobody else can get into. Hmm. Exactly. They're eating it away from everybody else. Now, everybody's working, doing things. Well, at least that's the idea, much like America. 
everybody works, right? And, uh, but so people get these things. The priests don't work. Well, I mean, they do. They're endlessly doing things like keeping a fire going and doing all these sacrifices. But it was the offerings that gave them sustenance. And the sustenance is where they were, because these offerings are still offerings to God. They had to be eaten in the holy places because the priest had been offered to God and they can go into a holy place like normal people can't because they've been ordained and set aside and made holy that way. But now they also have to consume their part of the offering in the holy place, which I'm glad that Jesus kind of took away because if I could only eat in the church, I would be bored. And, uh, and I like people and like, so they're taking all these things and making cakes later and being like, see you guys later, maybe next day. But um, it, that was the idea. These are offerings for God. The holy place is set aside for the priest and for God. The priest eat it in the holy place so that it's still an offering for God, even though it's something that is sustaining them. And then they have to do it on leaven. Why on leaven? because anything's against leaven or because maybe they're supposed to endlessly remember the Passover. Again, verse 17, uh, wait, 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 where am I? Holy place in the court of the tent of meeting, they shall eat it. Boy, if I just kept reading, that's where it says, it shall not be baked with leaven. I have given it as their portion of my offerings by fire. It is most holy, like the sin offering and the guilt offering most holy these are there's three offerings that are called most holy it's not the burn offering it is this this grain offering and then the sin offering and the guilt offering and they're called most holy and the others are not and yet these are the only three that only the priest gets to eat a portion of it so they're called most holy because they are consumed by the priest in the tabernacle and that's what makes them most holy nothing else I need to put my finger down where I'm doing this. Like the sin of, yeah, 18. Every male among the descendants of Aaron shall eat of it as their perpetual due throughout your generations. From the Lord's offering by fire, anything that touches them shall become holy. Now that is a weird phrase. Shall become holy. Uh, The priests were ordained and set aside and allowed to go into holy places that the rest of the congregation was not. So the food that the priests got to eat in the holy places is something that because it was offered to God allowed them to become holy as well. And the idea behind this is it's only for the priests because they have been ordained and anyone who's not been ordained cannot eat it because it would make them holy as well even though they were not called by god to do so so this is god making sure that there's some kind of separation separation and differentiation verse 19 the lord spoke to moses saying this is the offering that aaron and his son shall offer to the lord on the day when he is anointed and, and so now we're beginning to talk about the day that Aaron's going to be anointed. And, and that means his ordination. And we're going, that's later in Leviticus, but not yet. But it's moving toward that. So this is what's going to happen on the day he's anointed. It's a grain offering. One-tenth of an ephah of choice flour as a regular offering, half in the morning and half in the evening. It shall be made with oil on a griddle. You shall bring it well soaked as a grain offering of baked pieces, and you shall present it as a pleasing odor to the Lord. And so the priest, anointed from among Aaron's descendants as his successor, shall prepare it. It is the Lord's, a perpetual dew, to be turned entirely into smoke. Every grain offering of a priest shall be wholly burned, and it shall not be eaten. So when someone is ordained, a grain offering, now just speaking to the priest, comes from the priest and the whole thing has to be consumed because now it's all to God and your priest giving an offering to God and then taking some for themselves just doesn't make sense. Verse 24, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to Aaron and his sons. This saying, this is the ritual of the sin offering. Or if you're in the NIV regulation, or if you're in the RSV, the uh, law. This is the ritual of the sin offering. 
The sin offering shall be slaughtered before the Lord at the spot where the burnt offering is slaughtered. It is most holy. The priest who offers it as a sin offering shall eat of it. It shall be eaten in a holy place in the court of the tent of meeting. Whatever touches its flesh shall become holy. And when any of its blood is splattered on a garment, you shall wash the bespattered part in a holy place. Again, the blood is holy and it's the purification piece. Blood is what purifies. Don't know why it's why blood would purify. It's a, it's a life force. It's for God alone. There's something about it. It's the same as in Christianity. There's something about the blood of Christ. We say it every time we do communion. This cup is a new covenant sealed in my blood for the forgiveness of sins. Blood is huge. And if blood touches some of the garments, it hasn't ended up where it's supposed to. And so they need to be cleansed appropriately. And that's what's going on there. Uh, verse 28, an earthen vessel in which it was boiled shall be broken. So if you're you know, cleaning things in an earthen vessel, or no, this is actually cooking. If you're boiling things in an earthen vessel, you break it when you're done. Which, if you're me, then maybe I'll go on and be like, what else can I do? Uh, but if it's boiled in a bronze vessel, that shall be scoured and rinsed with water. Basically, when you're done cooking these things, you have to, uh, so it's so holy, it's so set aside, it's so ritualistic that you can no longer use these things without intense cleaning or destruction of it if they don't feel like intense cleaning is possible, like with an earthen vessel because things get stuck in the pores and you might have blood in there. You don't want to do that again. But if you have a bronze thing, you can cleanse the blood out and you're going to be all right. It's just God's way of keeping things separated. And it's, it's fascinating. Verse 29, every male among the priests shall eat of it. It is most holy, but no sin offering shall be eaten from which any blood is brought into the tent of meeting for atonement in the holy place. It shall be burned with fire. So when you use one of your sin offerings on Yom Kippur, the day of atonement, you cannot eat that. That blood has been used to purify the holy of holies. And because it's been used to purify the holy of holies, the whole thing gets to be consumed. So the priest gets to stay away from it. Oh, nine minutes. Let's see what we can do with verse or chapter seven. This is the ritual of the guilt offering. It is also most holy. At the spot where the burnt offering is slaughtered, they shall slaughter the guilt offering, and its blood shall be dashed against all sides of the altar, and its fat shall be offered. The broad tail, the fat that covers the entrails, the two kidneys with the fat that is on them, the loins and the appendage of the liver, which shall be removed with the kidneys. The priest shall turn them into smoke on the altar as an offer of offering of fire by fire to the Lord. It is a guilt offering. Every male among the priests shall eat of it. It shall be eaten in a holy place. It is most holy. So this is, again, the same kind of thing, different offering, but how they go about it. Verse 7, the guilt offering is like the sin offering. There is the same ritual for them. The priest who makes atonement with it shall have it. So again, just who gets to have these pieces, how they go about doing it. These are rules and regulations for the priest. Verse 8, so too the priest who offers any one's burnt offering shall keep the skin of that burnt offering that he has offered. So now who gets the skin? Apparently the priest who actually does the, uh, the, the sacrifice or the offering in the end. Um, so now they're trying to differentiate who gets what. Basically, if you're working that day as a priest, you get to actually keep the things that come in, like the skin or the eating or these other ways with which the priest may obtain resources and money themselves. Um, so, yeah, verse 9, and every grain offering baked in the oven and all that is prepared in a pan or on a griddle shall belong to the priest who offers it. So the priest has to bring their own stuff. But every other grain offering mixed with oil or dry shall belong to all the sons of Aaron equally. So basically, if someone comes with something that's pre-made, remember when we did the grain offering and you could bring flour or you could bring like bread? If you bring bread, 
a portion is broken off and the bread that's left over is for the priest that gives it. If you bring flour, a portion is given over and the rest of the flour is used by the whole of the priest. Does this seem strange? There's no real reason outside of practicality that I can figure out or anybody else can about why this is so. If you give a piece of bread and he breaks off a piece of bread and throws it onto the fire, there's just one piece of bread, eat it. If you have a bunch of flour, you can make a lot of pieces of bread. You yeah. don't get to keep all of that. You get to share it with everybody else. Practical. Verse 11, this is the ritual of the sacrifice of the well-being that one may offer to the Lord. Now, the well-being offering is another version of the fellowship offering or peace offering. If you offer it for Thanksgiving, you shall offer with the thank offering unleavened cake, mixed cakes mixed with oil, unleavened wafers spread with oil, and cakes of choice flour well soaked in oil. With your Thanksgiving sacrifice of well-being, you shall bring your offering with cakes of leavened bread. So, um... Basically, depending on things, you're also bringing bread. Now, why might you also have to bring bread if you're going to have an offering of this well-being or fellowship or peace offering? Anybody have any idea why you'd also bring bread? Well, you're going to feed the community. Easier to share. Yeah. Amen. Both ways. You're absolutely right. Not only is it easier to share, you're feeding more people. So you better bring more because you have a reason to celebrate. Can we all please remember the incredible hospitality of those who come from the Middle East? Anyone ever been out there and tried to like get away being hungry? There's many laws in the, in the Middle East times and, 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 and the ones that are, are still, uh, that we can see are actually from our Muslim uh, brothers and sisters who uh, at the time of the prophet Muhammad, uh, when, someone who was in the community stole because they were hungry. They weren't punished. Their neighbors were punished. Why were their neighbors punished? Because their neighbors didn't feed them when they were hungry and moved them to the place of destitution whereby they needed to steal in order to live. Hospitality was so important to the people of the Middle East that if people were hungry, those who were their neighbors were considered sinful. Now, of course, Jesus would say the same thing. Matthew 25, the third and final parable of Matthew 25. When I was hungry, you gave me something to eat or when I was hungry, you didn't give me something to eat. And both classes of people ask him, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry and gave you something to eat or didn't give you something to eat? And Jesus says, whatever you do for the least of these or do not do for the least of these, you do for me or did not do for me. You know, we have rampant issues in our country if we're going to claim to be a Christian country. Now, I'm comfortable with the separation of church and state. I really am. I don't need some people who claim to know Jesus in the Bible be anywhere near government. I don't even think they need to be anywhere near Jesus in the Bible. <laughs> However, we're about to go into pieces and I'm actually going to run out of time. I'm going to run out of time. So I'm going to end with a couple of things. We're about to go into ways of how quickly some of these offerings of the well-being offering need to be eaten. There's, there's two kinds. Both, most of the versions of them, they need to be eaten the day of the sacrifice, the day of the offering. Don't wait until tomorrow to eat it. When, if you wait and you eat it tomorrow, it is, and, and the word in Hebrew might actually be um, like, uh, 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 what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, not ripe, not rank, not uh, rotten. Boy, God, I can rotten. It, it, the word in Hebrew is rotten. And it's not just rotten because maybe meat would spoil in the night. I mean, does anyone try to eat like a bunch of like uh, ribs that you just left on the counter the day before and see what happens to your insides? Um, 
there's a version where you can eat it the next day and but not by the third day then it's rotten and if you eat it on the second day or the third day depending on the kind of offering you are cut off from the people and there are commentators who are wondering why are people cut off from the people if they're not consuming the full of the offering that day and the only part we've read so far is when you're bringing this kind of offering you darn well better bring a lot of bread too <laughs> And if you have anything left over the next day, mind you, this is also the way majority of people, we believe at this time, ate their meat. Most people only got meat because of the offering systems of the ancient tabernacle, which by the way, meant that people were eating much more humanely slaughtered meat than we're eating today. So they had this thing, and if there was any left over the next day, it was needing to be destroyed, and it was considered to be something that was rotten, and if you ate it, you'd be cut off from the people, and why? And the easiest answer as to why is what we've already said. It means that you didn't share. And if you're not sharing, God doesn't have any time for you and will cut you off from the full of the people, much like the manna was rotten the next day. The idea behind this is twofold. Not only does God give you what you need when you need it. Now we're Americans, we don't actually believe that anymore. There's no such thing as Americans that believe that. If there were, we wouldn't have savings accounts and debt and all sorts of other things. We exist in a framework where why we don't believe that God provides. We just don't. We'd rather have security than faith because we have more faith in ourselves than in God. I don't know what that means for God in our relationship. I'm just telling you what Jesus thinks. At this particular point in time, if you were trying to save to the next day, it was considered an act of incredible lack of faith in God and incredible injustice for the needs of your neighbors. And it was such an affront to God that it ended your relationship with the community. And by ending your relationship with the community, that would often mean death just because you didn't share. I don't know what to tell people about this other than this sounds exactly like Jesus. Mm -hmm. And it's unfortunate that we are very happy talking about how we're close to God because of the sacrifice of the Christ instead of recognizing what it means to remember Christ. And I'm going to end with a story of the Prophet Muhammad. I'm not a Muslim. I just like sometimes using Islam to shake Christians who think they're somehow better because they follow Jesus, even though they don't actually listen to anything he says. Not saying that's you, by the way. I just know this might be viewed by people in a thousand years because it's on Facebook. <laughs> and might as well look like I'm John the Baptist while I'm being crazy wearing a shirt that says Yosemite. <laughs> <laughs> you may have heard the prophet Muhammad had a fair amount of wives well his wives were always upset with him when it came evening time so the story goes because at the time when everybody would be going off to bed Muhammad would go through the cabinets in his house and empty them of every last scrap of food he could find and then go into the community and find anybody who was hungry and gave them food so the next morning when his wives awoke they didn't have any food to feed anybody, to which Muhammad said Allah would provide. What would that be like? I don't know. I don't have the faith. All of the things that I just said, pointing the finger at everybody else, those three fingers are pointing back at me. I have savings accounts. I have pension programs. I'm nervous about the future. I don't have that faith. But I know that Christ wants me to. And I know that it's part of the whole tradition because in these two chapters that we didn't read all of, that voice of God shows up again. 
All I know is, is that I read Leviticus, God is teaching us to practice justice and faith. And we haven't even gotten to the laws yet. We're just talking about the rituals. And so we should pay attention to every ritual we do in church, because I promise you, if we focus on these rituals, try to understand them, don't just call them traditions, things that we've always done because we've always done them. We will find in those rituals, the justice and the faith that God still demands of us. Any questions, comments, and or concerns? Not that I really care about you. I have, uh, I have a comment. Bruce and I travel extensively in the Southwest and we've had the privilege to visit various Pueblos on their feast day. Mm. And their feast days are really a combination of the Catholic faith that, that most of them are Catholic and their, oh. and their native faith on the Pueblos. Very frequently, there is a big tent where every, which, everybody is fed. Well, there is, everybody has brought bread and left it in that tent. In the, from the Pueblo. From, from their ovens, from the Pueblo. And as you go through that tent, everybody is given a loaf of bread. As a visitor. As a visitor. Amen. And if you are noticed, it is not infrequent that they will invite you into their homes to share with their celebration. We haven't gotten that opportunity yet. But I imagine that if we attended a feast day two or three years in a row, that would happen for us. So I, it's, uh, it's interesting to me that it's similar. I, I came from Yuba City and in Yuba City, it has a, uh, a Sikh temple. It has the second largest Sikh population in the world outside of the Punjab, um, Yuba City. The Sikh temple in Yuba City, you can go to, um, as far as I know, any time of day and get food if you're hungry. And when they have their Sikh parade and you have the, the size of the city like triples as people just come from across the country. Sikhs from across the country end up in Yuba City in November for the Sikh parade. They read their full scriptures and they uh, through the parade. And if you're on the parade route, if you ever go, there are vendors and not one of them is selling food, but they're all giving food away. Hmm. Because they have that same sense of hospitality. Um, I love what we do on Fridays as a church. Again, this moment whereby uh, there's food given out and there's these kind of food. And I mean, how do we, uh, we, we participate in people's kitchen, uh, knowing then that there are people who are homeless can always kind of find things. Um, I love that. In my first church, we worked with other churches to make sure that there was at least one hot meal available to anyone who was hungry in that town every day. Like there are things that when we hear this still need to be done and we don't need to just figure out how to feed like the hungry, but how do we make sure in the midst of all of this that we aren't just trying to grab onto everything so that we can give it away? Because this is the way of Jesus. And I know this, even though I'm not ready to live it. I've known it since I was 18 years old and I read the story of the rich young ruler when Jesus said to him, sell everything you have, give it to the poor and follow me. And I knew right then that that's what I was being asked to do as well. And I've not done it. Um, and, I, and I delude myself into saying that I can't do it because of my family. And uh, we're afraid, I'm afraid, let me change this. I'm afraid of living as radically as Jesus demands but no longer can I be afraid of telling everybody that he demands this of us. Because now we get to figure out what to do with it. Isn't it wonderful that when we read the Bible, 
even these old words that don't make sense anymore, by the time we're done with them, we still see the same God who tells us, love everybody, love them. I'm going to end. You guys have been amazing. I really, and I say this every week, because especially when I'm dealing with Leviticus, like, you know, I, Leviticus scares the bejeebus out of people. <laughs> people read it and they're like, what? And I, that's why I think I've decided that I'm going to do Revelation next. I'm going to like, I'm, while I'm in this church, I'm going to endlessly choose the worst books of the Bible to do <laughs> studies on. <laughs> Because I believe when I go through them that I find mm -hmm. still the same God, the same love, the same justice. And the more I read this ancient, ancient library of books and poems and narratives and genealogies and laments and so much more and letters, and all saying the same thing. And so instead of being afraid by books that people told us to be afraid of, let's dive into them and find the living God who wants to dance with us because God wants to dance with us. I'm going to pray. I'm going to let you go. Thank you for dealing with me. I love you all. Good and gracious God. Thank you for this time where I can say in utter honesty, my own failures as one and yet know that because of your grace, you do not abandon me but constantly call me. May all of these people know you constantly call them as well. And may we not be utterly transformed in such a way that makes us unrecognizable, but people who go through the slow process of the journey with you so that others might see this process and come to see the beauty in it and thereby want to be closer to you as well. God, I thank you that you have given such people a heart for you, for why else would they be on Zoom with a half crazy pastor talking about Leviticus? May they know simply by being here that you have felt their love and may they feel yours. I pray this all in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. 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 All right, dear souls, it's getting dark in here. You can tell because I haven't turned on the light. Oh, I didn't have to turn on the light, though. I <laughs> like this time of year so much better. <laughs> Take care, y'all. Bye, all. We love you. Thanks, Thanks, you. Love you, too.